All right, this uh, uh, session is being chaired by um, our acting associate dean, Catherine Wolfram, and it's about partnerships and globalization. Uh, it's a very interesting panel, um, shaping and governing globalization, forging new growth partnerships. We have a great panel. Um, we have Annalie Saxinian, who's our dean of our very famous um, School of Information at UC Berkeley. Um, we have three great schools here, just uh, around the corner, the Engineering School, the Haas School of Business, and the School of Information. They really have a great <laughs> ecosystem. We're so, and then the Law School is there too, that's right, when, when we get in trouble. Um, <laughs> and very expensive. Um, and Sudhir Jalan, Chair and Managing Director of Meenakshi Tea Company, would be joining us here. Thank you, sir. And Sean Randolph, Senior Director of Bay Area Council Economic Institute. Uh, without any further ado, Catherine, please take over. I think it's I think, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Solomon. And I should note that I am subbing for Jay Stowski, the Associate Dean for Instruction, who knows more than about who knows more about trade than I do. I am an economist, though, so trade, the gains from trade, is part of my DNA. Uh, so I will, I will, I will channel that. I will go back to my graduate school days and remember about the great <laughs> gains from trade. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to thank our panelists here. Solomon introduced them, but let me just do that again. To my immediate left is uh, Dean Anno Saxenian of the School of Information. Uh, next to her is Sean Randolph, the Senior Director of the Bay Area Council Economic Institute. Um, Sanjay Kirloskar uh, of Kirloskar Brothers Limited. <laughs> And then on the very end of the panel is Sudhir Jalan from Manakshi T. Thank you all for joining us. So the questions that were laid out in the agenda, um, the first question says, what will it prevent, what will it take to prevent a world trade war? And to me, that's pretty dire. Are, are we really headed to a world trade war? I think that would be my first question. Um, so let me invite the panel. I'll, I'll go in order of the way people are seated here um, to, to contemplate that. Are we, are we really headed for a world trade, so, trade war? And if so, what can we do uh, to prevent it? So please tell me about your experience with globalization, your experience with trade, and to the extent you're comfortable, make some projections into the future. Okay, yeah. do you want, how long do you want us to take? I mean, we were told we would each talk for five minutes. Five, yeah, five or six. Yeah, question for yeah. five minutes. Um, go for f okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. It's great to be here. Um, I, I've enjoyed listening to the other sessions earlier today. I think what I say is going to be a little bit heterodox in this panel because when I think about globalization, trade is not the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. For me, um, my understanding of technology globalization comes from a lot of research I've done in Silicon Valley and understanding how technology regions develop and grow. And um, just to sort of cut a long story short, one of the reasons it's very, very difficult for scholars and others to understand Silicon Valley is they've looked at it in the way that they looked at traditional regions like Detroit, uh, and they thought, okay, there's a couple big companies. And in fact, the dynamism of Silicon Valley is rooted in its decentralization. And it's very complex um, networks of people, of ideas, of money that interchange really, it, it's not visible at the surface, but it's below the surface. Um, and I think that has fueled, um, we can debate whether today that's changing. Um, there were some intimations about that earlier today, but for sure the dynamism of that region has been a bottom-up process, not a top-down one. Um, so then if you take the next step and understand how Silicon Valley is globalized, what I've learned from my research, and I, I started going to India in the early 90s, um, what I, I learned is that the early development of Bangalore, of Hyderabad, of the places that are the, were the early hotspots in software development was led by um, Indian Americans, often places like Texas Instruments, Hewlett Packard, people who went back and forth, who advocated for changing policy, for creating a space for technology development, that it was very much a lot of the early, what we would, would then call body shopping contracts, came through personal relationships, Indian Americans and Indians, going back and forth. Um, and so I focused, and I, the same process 
occurred in Israel, in Taiwan, in China, um, of what I call brain circulation, people going back and forth, technologists, entrepreneurs, engineers, angel investors, venture capitalists, and this circulation of people, these networks, went from being local within Silicon Valley to being cross-national. Usually weren't, weren't fully global, because it usually was, you know, the Indian Americans went to India, the Chinese went to China, so I call it a cross-regional. Um, okay, so if that's what I see as the dynamism behind globalization, the fact that we may well be entering a trade war, which I, I think it's possible because of our current president, um, <laughs> um, unfortunately, I, I think um, is, is not as relevant, as not as important as it might have been a decade ago. I, I think that we ought to focus on um, really promoting the kind of learning and um, collaboration that goes on between individuals, between regions, um, because that's really where uh, a lot of the, um, a lot of the way that the global economy has developed uh, is rests on that, you know, regional decentralization and connections between these nodes, people to people connections. Now, lots of people, um, you know, it's lots of people going back and forth lots of times, so it's very hard to trace. It's not like I can take a multinational and study its footprint around the world. It, so, so it makes this very complicated as a scholar. Um, but I, I, I think that allows a much richer flow of ideas and of upgrading in both places. So a lot of my research suggests that there's mutual upgrading between regions through this process. That Silicon Valley has actually, because India became so good at doing software development, large-scale software development, India, the U.S. kind of just gave up on it, just like they gave up on manufacturing um, in, uh, when China sort of moved in and perfected it. And so you've seen an emerging global division of labor but Silicon Valley remains, you know, the place where the new markets are best understood, where architectures are defined, where new products are defined. Um, but we know a lot of the development is going on in India. Um, manufacturing is in, in China, you know, and so forth. Uh, so, so I'd just like to refocus our attention away from trade a bit, even if um, my panelists uh, will return to it, and, and suggest that that's another avenue to think about globalization. It's also very consistent with what we heard from Solomon this morning and from uh, Vivek Wadwa, which is that because of the technology, we don't, these things don't need to be top down. You know, people first is actually also something, this is, can be a much less state-led process. It can be a bottom-up process if you conceptualize it this way. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah, so hard to put barriers on trade and ideas, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Okay. And capital, you know, you can. But. <laughs> So coming back to the idea of trade wars, um, so bilateral trade, investment, economic, immigration relationships all have a context. And so what happens between the US and India has a context. Uh, it's become more challenging, let's say, in the last couple of years, and certainly more complex, uh, with uh, the different policy shifts uh, we're seeing in Washington right now. So. Uh, do I think we're going into a global trade war? Not necessarily. I, I, I think the way we seem to be going under President Trump's leadership is um, he seems not to believe in multilateral agreements or negotiations because they limit U.S. sovereignty and limit U.S. negotiating flexibility. Um, maybe great if you're buying and selling buildings, but you know, globally that may be a different a different world. But I think that's the way he approaches it. So. I think what we are seeing is a probably a conscious attempt to unthread or partially dismantle the global uh, trade and investment system that's been built up over the last 70 years since World War II. Uh, so much emphasis has been, I think, appropriately put on multilateral institutions, multilateral trade and investment agreements, collaborations, uh, things of that nature. And I think we're seeing those being uh, pulled apart in favor of a series of one-off bilateral discussions or negotiations where the spirit seems to be you can bludgeon or you can maneuver your party if you're talking to them directly at the US rather than in a group of people. So I think that that's more the where we're going. On the trade stuff, presumably they'll make a deal at some point. They'll make a deal with the EU, they make a deal with Canada, with Mexico, and with everybody else out there. Uh, I think the question is, so this will end at some point, but the question is, what's left after that of the structure? We've all 
uh, pretty much grown up in that has really been designed to facilitate uh, international and multilateral cooperation on a, on a number of different levels. Uh, there are, I think, positive things to be said then. So leaving aside trade war, no, probably not at the end of the day. Uh, that there is, India kind of has a different context with the US and it, this has been true for many, many decades to a degree, but China is always in the background and we're seeing perhaps a drawing more closely together of the US and India around certain things like defense, uh, other issues to come. So I think we need to look at the India dialogue on its own terms, apart from the rest of the context, but acknowledging all the complexities that touch on it. Uh, then I would agree also with Anna, though, that it, it's not all about trade that you would you know, put something in an airplane or put it on a ship and move it back and forth. That so much of what happens, uh, this technology enabled happens despite all that or parallel to all of that. It's not affected that directly by governmental policies uh, at all. Uh, there is the exchange of people and uh, of course immigration policies can affect that. So we need to keep an eye out for that. Uh, but uh, so much of the, the international exchange is between sectors through global supply chains, which are also under threat right now. But uh, it's more the te technology enabled exchanges uh, between especially cities and regions and states and countries where there's mutual interest, where Silicon Valley is a major global hub. It's the premier global club for technology and innovation and entrepreneurship. Other companies such as India come into play on it, on that stage. And we connect around the world based on where the best capacity is for manufacturing and for, for human capital pools. So I think that really promises, just on a fundamental level, uh, a lot of opportunity with India, notwithstanding the politics we're seeing around uh, international trade generally. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so you participate in trade. <laughs> yeah, we do. I come from India, so I'll go back 2,000 years. <laughs> yeah, uh, not just Silicon Valley. But I, I guess as long as man's been around and has had needs and desires, uh, there has been trade. And uh, if you go back uh, 2,000 years ago, uh, Roman coins have been found on the eastern coast of India. Why? Because, you know, cool. yeah. people would come for muslin, for spices. And uh, even then, uh, the Roman senators were complaining about gold and silver moving east. So while the world has changed, it still remains the same, right? Uh, we see that with China. Uh, a lot of complaints about the number of dollars that are held by China. But, you know, my take of uh, what's been happening, I've been working for the last uh, three decades, and I'm in the manufacturing business. Sometimes I wonder about how I'm going to stay relevant, and uh, I don't really know what's going on in Silicon Valley, though I know it would be very useful for me. But, uh, you know, the West has pushed for uh, opening up of markets, for uh, uh, investment into the uh, developing world, while uh, we've been resisting that, and uh, also asking for mobility of labor. And I think that's one of the problems, even now, uh, the immigration policies that you see. So I run a company uh, which is in a rural area, and uh, it's probably like an anchor company. There's uh, no one else over there. And I can well imagine what happens when a mo company like that moves out. And I think that's what's led to Trump. Uh, many US companies have moved out. And I hope I don't sound like a socialist, but uh, I think uh, socialism is uh, not that unpopular here now. It depends who you talk to. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, what the U.S. and the West tried to do for the last 50 years uh, is try to have trading rules or global trading rules. And uh, after the Second World War, the U.S. was in a much stronger position. Uh, to a certain extent, could have its way with the Marshall Plan or even otherwise. And now, uh, Things are a little different. Uh, the relative strengths of different blocks and different economies, uh, I mean, they are quite strong compared to the US, I think. Europe is as big as the US. China is maybe half the size of the US. And so it's going to be very interesting how things move forward. Uh, so while uh, 
Trump has imposed these tariffs, uh, he's still talking about, uh, he's using WTO rules. He's invoked national security, right? Uh, it's a stretch. But I think the other side is also uh, uh, trying to do the same by saying they want to retaliate to protect their domestic industry. So, you know, you have a situation where both are trying to play within, by the rules of the WTO, and therefore, whether a trade war is imminent, uh, your guess is as good as mine. And I don't know, I mean, how Mr. Trump wakes up. Today he's uh, got another 250 uh, billion dollars of tariffs on China, I think he's thinking of. So uh, to that, I think we also have to consider what, it's ha what is happening in Silicon Valley. Uh, I still have to set up factories around the world to have a presence. But you see companies like Apple, right? And I buy their product uh, from the music store, uh, right? And how, does gov how do governments control that? But I think maybe I'm going ahead. Uh, so whether there's going to be a trade war or not, I hope not. Um, <laughs> and then let Sudhir have the next. Uh, Thank you, yeah, Sudhir. Catherine, may I start by taking a controversial route. <laughs> That's always welcome, yeah. By challenging the whole premise of this subject. <laughs> I feel the trade barriers will be not an impediment to globalization. Uh -huh. Expand on that. I I'll illustrate. I'm from India. I flew into San Francisco on Lufthansa, a German airline. I started my day today by using a Unilever product, British Dutch toothpaste. Worked on a Samsung Korean iPad. And so on and so on. So we are, the whole world is so interdependent on each other that it's almost impossible to stop globalization. Mm -hmm. And if you look at globalization, taking off from where Sanjay said, it has three stages. The first time was, according to me, probably when Columbus discovered America, I think 1492. The whole world shrunk from large to medium because people started trading spices and others, many items. But it was countries which were involved in this. 1492 to 1800. Second stage was 1800 to 2000 with the Industrial Revolution, the railroad, the steam engine, communications, everything. And the whole world again became closer and closer and closer and from became from a medium scale to a small scale. Everything shrunk. And from the year 2000 the, to the present time and continuing is the digitization, the internet, this Google, whatever you have. The whole world is being shrunk from a small to tiny. So the whole world is globalizing and yet becoming tiny. So, so everything is so interlinked. Can you imagine Silicon Valley existing without Bangalore? or the other way around? Can we survive for even few years with any country, however insulated it may be, on its own? Can we have an iron curtain like the Russian type? Can we have bring back the Berlin Wall? Certainly not. And there will be impediments to globalization. We are not, not the depression, the two world wars, they were all impediments to globalization. And yet, we came through. And this is, according to me, the trade barriers of Mr. Trump, of course, not very desirable, according to me, but are a small blip. They will go away. Either they will be faced with counter-resistance of such vehemence from all the countries of the world, because he has taken on the entire world. Mm -hmm. It's not one country that he will have to go back. He's a businessman. 
He makes aggressive moves, withdraws. <laughs> makes aggressive move, withdraws. So I'm not too bothered about the trade barriers. India will be affected for some. It will gain some. Because, see, if you have higher trade barriers with China, maybe you will import more from India. So I'm an optimist always that there is an opportunity. New barrier, new frontiers will open. Thank you. So it's relentless. Yeah, I, 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 I like that perspective, unstoppable. Um, yeah, and taking off on your description of your day and the number of products that you engaged with, um, it brings to mind, I've been doing work at a solar microgrid provider, and so I've spent time in um, rural Rajasthan, and yeah, people have Samsung phones and Unilever toothpaste and solar panels built by the Chinese. Um, and so I want to bring the discussion a bit to thinking about the, the base of the pyramid um, in India and how globalization and trade is, is affecting the base of the pyramid. Yes, as, as Sanjay mentioned, the U.S. is experiencing job loss and manufacturing plants shutting down. Are they, are they opening in India? And India is, is gaining, the base of the pyramid is gaining? Or what is it, is it not kind of homogeneous? Are there different experiences? Can, can we speak a bit about what's happening um, to, to, say, the lower third of the population in India as a result of globalization? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, two of my biggest competitors are U.S. And both of them have started plants in India. So I'm sure that uh, India will gain. Uh, India will gain in, uh, by way of technology, newer products. There will be more competition. So I think it will be good for uh, India. It will be good for me because I will have to shape up uh, better than what I am uh, today. But uh, yeah. Uh, the bottom of the pyramid, I think more jobs, number one, more jobs being created. Uh, as more and more, Mr. Modi has his Make in India initiative. So as more and more uh, companies find India more attractive, I believe that more people will come to India, see that there is a huge market. And I think that leads, that, that has a snowball effect, right? As more people earn, the more money they have to spend. And it won't be just Indian products that they'll be buying. Uh, there will be other possibly aspirational Western products that they would like to buy. And uh, as more Indians come out of poverty, I think that's a great positive for the rest of the world, that the rest of the world will be able to participate in the Indian market. I'll, I'll say something about this from the point of view of the technology sector. I, I don't think it has been oriented at all towards the bottom third of the pyramid. I think that, um, I think there's a lot of talk um, and there's a lot of well-intentioned people, um, you know, and, and I think there are many efforts on the sort of in the villages on the grassroots that are very interesting. My um, eldest child spent a year, um, a couple of years ago in India, um, trying to do um, solar energy. Hmm. It was very hard. Yeah, yeah. He was partnered yeah. with an Indian sort of what I would call a state-owned company. It wasn't exactly state-owned, but it was a government enterprise. And he found it very frustrating. So I, I guess when I listened this morning to the, um, the talk about how fast things were changing and how fast it was going to globalize and how fast the bottom of the pyramid would be absorbed, I, I, I sort of had a little bit of a pause. And I thought, what would, what would Jamie say? Um, I think the, the really interesting bottom of the pyramid stuff may be the innovations that are going on in healthcare. In some of these, you know, and maybe in education it could happen. In some of these services that are really directly serving um, people in the rural areas and, and maybe in solar energy if you can be efficient. You know, we've had the same experience that just bringing people electricity, it doesn't solve your life. It, no. it brings you electricity and then you have to buy an appliance, but if you're income constrained, you might not be able to. And you have to, and you have to support it, you have to service it, you have to have the yeah, technology yeah. to keep it running. It's a, it's a complex situation. Yeah. Sidir? You made a point about jobs. Now, Let's look at, say, India, and I'm sure more or less similar things will apply to USA. Today, with productivity going up, with digitization, artificial intelligence, jobs are bound to come down in that same industry. But many more industries start coming up. Say, for example, just go back. When the first time the railroads must have come, 200 years back, there must have been an agitation how many horse cart 
employees must have gone off. But did railroads create employment or they created unemployment? The foundries would not have come, all the iron steel would not have come, on the ancillarization would not have come, the backward integration, the forward integration would not have come. The movement would not have been so there. The global world would not have been closer. So all progress, digitization, modernization, globalization creates job growth according to me. Thank you. So the, the next question I think is probably best first directed to, to Sean. So let me try this. Um, this is a conference about US India, but, but the maybe elephant in the room, maybe not quite elephant, uh, is, is definitely China. Um, and so in terms of trade, people are talking about the, the Belts and Roads program. And so the positive view of that is they're building infrastructure, they're building roads, they're, they're helping ship pass through channels more easily. So, you know, how can that be bad? That, that's reducing trade costs. That, that's kind of reducing barriers to trade. Um, but the, the more critical side of that is that it's, it's really neocolonialism, that, that, that China's got, you know, different designs than, than just increasing trade. Um, and, you know, I've, I've done a fair amount of work in sub-Saharan Africa and, and definitely see the presence of, of Chinese building big infrastructure projects, building railroads, building um, coal plants in, in some instances. So, um, yeah, I guess I'd, I'd like to kind of throw, throw China into the mix. Or, or, sh or should they be in this discussion? And, and you know, is it neocolonialism neo or is it pure, pure good, enhancing trade? Uh, not pure good. Okay. <laughs> uh, but maybe something else. No, I, I think we should talk about China because that's part of that broader global context. Uh, so whatever we're talking about with India, at some point it's going to touch on one of these non-Indian, non-U.S. issues. So with China, uh, if you, just to take Belt and Road, uh, the Chinese government clearly has a vision, and you've got to give them credit. This is a long-term vision, a really big play. I can't say the U.S. has similar vision at this point. Uh, so if we take that as a given, uh, we can debate, like, what's the intent? Uh, is it to, as construction slows down in China, to employ Chinese on construction projects outside of China? Uh, clearly it is to have a, a chain built, or a two chains at least, from China across to Europe that become, you know, the New Silk Road, transmission and logistical routes uh, anchored by Chinese financed and built facilities that link China more closely with Central Asia and ultimately with Europe. Um, fair enough. The, to the extent that brings infrastructure into those countries, it wouldn't be there. Uh, I think it's hard to argue with that. Um, most of them need it. Uh, the question more becomes where China is using primarily or overwhelmingly Chinese workers coming into the Chinese company to build this stuff. And when it's financed by loans that in many cases these countries can't afford and they, they actually end up faced with considerable debt that they can't repay as we've seen in Sri Lanka recently. And then in the case of the port the Chinese built, it defaults to a 99-year lease to China. So I think, I forget whether it was Pakistan or Burma, that just took a look at this recently themselves and said, oh, just a minute, maybe we should scale back what we're doing hmm. with China and Belt Road because we know we actually can't repay hmm. all this money that's being pushed our way. So a lot of it, I think, depends the implication on uh, how the individual countries react and how they manage to those relationships uh, in terms of protecting and thinking through their own long-term interests. It's not just the infrastructure, but is it a new form of dependency? Are there major debt issues they're walking into that they perhaps can't handle? And I think on the Chinese side, uh, they probably need to figure out, uh, are they playing this correctly? So maybe they should be opening it more to uh, international uh, contracts. Fewer Chinese workers, fewer Chinese companies. Maybe Indian companies, maybe US or European. So it's hard to say exactly how it's going to play out, except I think the yellow flags are up, uh, that this has the potential to play out badly, uh, certainly for lesser developed countries. But I think the other part of the context where China is concerned, thinking about India now, is that you know, for the US, for this administration, but I think more broadly even, China is a really unique entity. Uh, it has, it's the second largest economy in the world now. Uh, 
nobody except the Chinese would call it a developing economy now. Uh, it is extraordinarily strong in AI. It has highly focused, articulated policies around technology uh, with the articulated aim to be the dominant or a major global leader in a wider range of technologies over a fairly short period of time. It's investing enormous amount of government financial resources in this. So half the venture capital invested in China is actually government money. Uh, and not to mention the other investment in science and other things. So where that, I guess, raises big yellow flags in the US now is the concern that if China is advancing technologically, uh, if it's protecting its market, a variety of things that are being debated now, it, it's not the same as if that was happening in France. You know, China's a different entity on the global stage, and what they do has strategic implications for the US, uh, major technological implications in terms of global competition, if what they achieve is not done through what we would consider to be a fair uh, method that abides by global standards, WTO rules, things like that. So where India comes in, I think India will probably benefit from that because India is, forget what administration, this administration or the last, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's recognized as a democracy, uh, recognized as being different from the US, it is history, but uh, sharing certain values together as democracies uh, and mutual respect in that sense, and, and not being a threat to the US. You could be in a certain company and be really challenged by competitive industry, but I don't think India is or will be ever considered a threat, potentially in the, strategically in the way that China is. So I think we're seeing the Trump administration uh, sort of increasing its focus on India uh, as a very big Asian country, uh, potentially a strategic partner of sorts, uh, certainly more closely aligned with us uh, in the US than, than with China. And that kind of opens the door, I think, to doing some new and creative things with, with India. Now, those things should happen notwithstanding whatever's happening with China. But I think, nevertheless, the issues that are increasing between the US and China right now uh, are ultimately playing to the benefit of the US relationship with, uh, with India if it's managed well. Sudhir or Sanjay, I'd be very curious you know, to get your uh, perspectives. I don't do any business with China. Uh, but uh, I think you have to look at it from even China's in, point of view. Even Chinese in India? Like, I, I don't. I okay. mean, I'm, wow. I'm, I'm too scared of them. Huh. Uh, they, will, they might copy technology or whatever. Uh, uh, but, you know, you have to look at uh, the way China sees itself. I mean, the Middle Kingdom, right? They, they look down upon everyone else for most of uh, human history. Uh, and they're doing things, they, they have a long-term vision, like you said. They know exactly, I think, where they want to be. They have the money to do it. And who is helping them? I mean, okay. from, what, uh -huh. from my point of view, it's the West. Mm -hmm. I mean, who's setting up uh, jet engine factories in China? It's GE. Who's uh, building planes in China? It's Airbus. Uh, and China has figured out the way to get people to do what it wants. I mean, so many of my competitors have plants in China, and they complain all the time about their technology being stolen, and it's been going on for decades, and yet they want to be there. You've heard complaints about Indian IP rules, right? But I believe Indian companies behave far more honorably with IP than uh, the Chinese companies. So China is growing in its own, at its own pace. Uh, what happens to other countries, I, I don't think is their problem as long as it gets what it wants. And building this uh, one belt, one road, I think India is one of the few countries that has opposed it. But if you look at what the British did in India, I mean, if you ask any Englishman, uh, what did you leave uh, behind? And they can only talk about the English language, the game of cricket, and the railroad, right? And what was the railroad built for? It was to build and the bureaucracy, the steel frame. Uh, <laughs> but the railroad was built to take resources out of India, to the ports. So, you know, is it neo-colonialism? Possibly. 
uh, I don't think it's uh, anything but self-interest mm -hmm. as far as China is concerned. But if they want it and they have the ability to do it, isn't that what the U.S. did? <laughs> isn't that what any of us would do if we had uh, Seize the, opportunity. Uh, the means to? Huh. Can I just add, add to that the, uh, the role of U.S. companies in China? So I think all of them, all the big ones, are in this dilemma. And you go behind closed doors, and what they're yeah. talking about is it is really hard to resist the China market. It is huge, it is growing really fast, and there's innovation happening there that they want to be close to and part of. And so it's so hard for them to stand aside. Uh, on the other hand, they all know that by being in China, they'll be more or less at the mercy of whatever the government policies are, and that their IP is at risk, whether it's from IP theft or government-required technology transfer, in which case they're being set up in the position, potentially, of helping to create uh, a major Chinese competitor, at which point they've pretty much lost the market. So they're all weighing that, like, can we stay in China or go into China and do it in a way that we protect our core IP and participate in the market and preserve a long-term position rather than just a short-term benefit? So I think with that, they're not going to run away from China, but they're going to be more interested in alternatives. What, what can we do someplace else that we're not doing in China today? Then you look at what other countries have a really big, fast-growing market. It's not as wealthy as China's, of course, but a big Asian country with a fast-growing market. So who, who could that be? Uh, oh, here's a country with, that shares our values. It's a democracy. Uh, it respects IP more. Uh, and you can go in and, at a relatively greenfield level now and build something there. So obviously, India has its own complexities, but I think we're starting to see U.S. companies broaden their scope of options or thinking about as they go into Asia, as they build their global market presence. Uh, they did so much in China for so long, so much manufacturing in China, and they'll continue to do that. Uh, but I think they're going to be looking more now, well, what about ASEAN? What can we do maybe through Singapore and ASEAN? And I think India is really the big alternative. And that's why I say if, if we develop the relationship the right way, if India follows through on these reforms now and, and, and makes India an increasingly attractive place for these companies to come in and partner, I, I think it's an opportunity for India, in part because US companies are going to start looking for viable alternatives uh, to China. Hmm. So, dear? As, as I see it, Americans saw China as an opportunity, market, mm -hmm. tremendous market, and that's why everyone went there. Even knowing that IP is in danger, exit will be a problem. But I think they realized enough is enough. And so they now want to contain China, and no one likes competition. If I were an, an American, I'm not very happy if someone is trying to catch up and even stand up to me. So they need India. In fact, uh, a few of us were here last year, and we four or five of us and met the then Secretary of State, Mr. Tillerson, and a few senators. And they said, today, America needs India more than India needs America. Mm -hmm. And we need an access between America India, Japan, and Israel. Otherwise, this gorilla cannot be contained. Mm -hmm. And these are, in words, quote. Mm -hmm. So they know the threat of China. And I feel, I totally agree with Mr. Randolph, that India may be a beneficiary of the trade barriers between USA mm -hmm. and China. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I, I have a lot more questions. I think we should definitely talk about globalization and um, the environment. I think that's a huge issue, but I, I want to throw it out to the crowd. I, I hope that some of these issues will come out um, with the, the question and answer. So there's students walking around with microphones. Uh, the first hand I saw there was yeah, the gentleman. Thank you. Great session. Um, so so uh, as, as Dr. Jalan said, uh, Globalization is inevitable, but, but multilateral, bilateral treaties are always 
capital treaties. They're not focused on labor. And when we look at the Trump phenomenon, it's the labor that lost out in globalization that caused it. All the treaties, every time we talk about a globalization treaty, it's always about what's the most efficient way to, to work the treaty as far as capital output is concerned. Labor is never at the table. And I'm not trying to sound socialist, but I'm just trying. And when you look at mobility, we talk about the mobility of, of IP, mobility of capital. The most immobile part of the whole story is labor. Labor is immobile. And so my question to the panel is, how do we bring labor into the conversation? Because globalization is inevitable. We do want it. We'll eventually get to it. But how do we just expand the conversation from just capital and add labor as well into it? Go ahead, Anna. That's a, that's a hard one. Um, I mean, if you think about the labor movement in the US, it has sort of declined. Membership has continued to decline. Um, and it's hard to imagine it resurging in its current form. I mean, I, there are some of us who are hopeful that it might <laughs> come back in some other form at some point, in a different form than the traditional, you know, AFL, CIO, whatever. But I, I think that in, in, unless there's some organizational structure that can support labor to articulate its voice, um, I, I don't know how that can happen. Um, you know, I, I, sometimes I get, this is my naive idealism speaking right now, but I also think that the, old, the sort of capital labor thing may be the wrong categories for us to think about for the 21st century. And that if you look at what's happening in Silicon Valley today, one of the things you're seeing is engineers who, are they capital or are they labor? I don't know. They'll go off and start a company and they're capital, but maybe if they're working for Google, they're capital, uh, they're, they're labor. I mean, but, but then you have these people inside of the company who are protesting about policy. They're saying, we don't want to do business with the Defense Department. We don't want to you know, be doing unethical things. So, so maybe there's some new mobilization that could happen. I don't think this is a short-term thing. Around people who have strong ethical commitments, you know, and it, it will include, it may not look like the traditional labor movement that we saw in the US in the 20th century, you know, the manufacturing workers or the, the workers in the coal mines, you know, but it, but it could be a, a, a new thing. So I think that's the only place I can imagine this happening. I think on the, uh on the labor question, when the US, the first big multilateral agreement we had was, was NAFTA uh, about 25 years or so ago. So at that point, uh, the, the labor issue, along with the environmental topic, was sort of a, an afterthought. They weren't designed into the agreement, so they were kind of side agreements. And they addressed it, but that was an issue that this is not built into the agreement. Uh, subsequently, if the US has done sequential free trade agreements with many, many other countries. I think we have maybe 14 altogether now. Uh, the labor clauses have been built progressively deeper into the core agreements. Uh, so in the, whatever its current state may be today, uh, the renegotiated agreement with Mexico that may be part of an, a, an updated NAFTA, uh, the labor terms are part of the core agreement. They're not a side agreement. Now, those are really designed, and I haven't read the exact terms, primarily to uh, sort of protect, in this case, US workers against uh, companies moving to other countries for specifically lower wages, but really lower labor standards, countries that have lower labor protection. So I think in the agreements, you can address the issue of labor protections and labor standards and the enforcement of those standards. So you can do those, I think, in, inside, the, uh, inside the agreement. But I think the other thing to think about, it's a different topic, but in these agreements, yes, they're about trade, they're called trade agreements, but they're really investment agreements. They're, there are trade terms, uh, you lower the barriers, yes, but these days they're really about mobility of capital mm. and the ability of countries to invest in each other which sort of mixes up the labor card because you're sometimes creating jobs in one country and maybe fewer in another country. So I think the bigger issue on the trade agreements is really to think of them as investment agreements and then how do you deal with it in that context if you're able to deal with it. One question here. 
Yeah, yeah they're more, they're, I'm, I'm happy to let you interject if you want, but I think we have a lot of questions in the audience, so why don't, yeah. Um, in the last round of tariffs between US and China, one of the retaliations of China was 25% tariffs on US cotton. So as soon as China implemented tariffs on US cotton, it removes its tariff on Indian cotton, which was, I think, around 3%. So with, when and if a trade war does happen, uh, do you see a restructuring of some trade routes in the world, or, or maybe some countries in danger of becoming dumping grounds? Well, it, it, I wouldn't use the term dumping grounds, but certainly to the extent that things that are being moved around through trade are commodities, you can shift those around. So maybe there's a Chinese tariff on U.S. soybeans. So maybe the U.S. sells those soybeans to Brazil. And then the markets kind of shift around. So I think the commodity products just get shifted around. Uh, the routes are kind of reconfigured. Uh, there may be other things that are not commoditized that it's harder to shift around. And you know, if, if a company is making, and these are really supply chain issues, so if a company here in the U.S. is importing raw material, let's say steel, it could be anything, components from China that they are incorporating into a product being manufactured here by U.S. workers, and they don't have access to that or the tariff is going to be 25% now, uh, that's where it starts to get complicated because it actually damages manufacturing here and would cause companies here to hire fewer people than they would have uh, if it were not for the higher input costs. So that's where the whole supply chain thing comes in and get, makes it a much more complicated conversation in both directions. So I thought I saw a bunch of hands at one point. Um, all right, yeah, back there in the green shirt. No, the, you're turning around. <laughs> yep. Thanks for a great panel. Uh, talking about closure and the potential for conflict and cooperation. So one, I think I can divide the panel in two. One is for the Bay Area folks. Uh, I think Vivek Wadwa mentioned it this morning, you know, the sort of demise of the Silicon Valley model or it's slowing down at the very least, right? And I think we know that's becoming a consensus because The Economist magazine's written about it. Um, so there, if we've got, you know, platform monopolies and what's called the kill zone where the startups can't survive, do we have an opportunity or competition with Bangalore, Hyderabad, Gurgaon, and the rest of it? Um, what What is the... What's the ratio of cooperation and competition and flow likely to be um, as occasioned by that if, if you accept the premise that we're sort of slowing down um, the Silicon Valley model? And likewise, in closure, if um, the Trump um, tariffs either actually take effect or have a chilling effect on global trade, does this not create an opportunity for India or, or other countries? All right, Anna, you didn't okay. on, on the Silicon Valley model, since I was quoted in that Economist article as saying it had peaked, um, I, I wouldn't write off Silicon Valley yet. I mean, I, I think that the thing, it's not a slowing down that I see. The thing that I, I do worry about is these big companies that are sort of becoming anti-competitive, that are um, being challenged for all sorts of, of practices with the data, with the privacy. So I think... The question is, will that ultimately slow down the entrepreneurial process? Um, it might, but we've been proven wrong many times about Silicon Valley. One of the things that has always distinguished it is crisis after crisis, people predict it's dead, and then it recombines and revitalizes itself. I think it's still the deepest pool of skilled labor and sort of savvy capital about technology in the world. It certainly surpasses China, anything I've seen in Taiwan or Israel or India. So don't write it off yet. Uh, on the other hand, the story that I told earlier is about Silicon Valley becoming global by building networks and partnerships around the world. And so that will continue, and that will continue to, rel it, it's relative decline relative to other centers in the world. And I think there are many opportunities for the world. I think the opportunity for India or other places the opportunities are actually always there. It's just a matter of partnering and, and sort of figuring out ways to strategically partner, finding shared problems to solve, shared products, shared needs, and, and making that happen. Um, I think the places that are, are left behind now 
they're not left behind. They're left behind because of institutional problems in their own markets. So I always, my grandparents were from Armenia, right? It's a little country in the middle of the Caucasus. They keep trying to be a technology region, you know, as does everybody. But it's been the most corrupt place in the world until very recently. So, so you know, it's just not going to happen. I think India, as it cleans up what it's doing, you know, you have the skill base, you have a lot of the technology. Um, I, I think the, the, the opportunities are there to, for India to lose, not the opposite. So India could easily start to make a, a mark in many markets, whether it's healthcare or whatever. So Sanjay or Sudhir, I think yeah. the second half of the question was directed for, for you. Uh, is, uh, I is think uh, Trump yeah, creating, if yeah. the Trump tariffs do come in, then I think there are huge opportunities for India, like yeah. you said, but we have to grab them. I mean, if there's uh, tariffs on uh, Chinese steel, then India can come in. If China puts tariffs on U.S. soybean, India can su supply China. There, there are going to be opportunities uh, for a, any large economy. And it's not only India, but yeah. I think, like you said, everything will you know, stabilize itself over a period of time. I mean, even the TPP uh, that <laughs> Trump walked out of, I think Japan, Australia, they're moving ahead yeah. without the US. So uh, the world will go on. Another great opportunity comes. If the Chinese market look, looks like getting closed to the Americans, they would like to tap the Indian market. So they will try and bring new technology to India. So put up joint ventures in India, so the technology which China was getting will now start coming to India. Huh. Interesting. I think on, on the Silicon Valley future question, I agree completely with, with Anno that there, there have been, it's a wonderful media topic. Every five or 10 years, there's some article saying, California dream is dead. Silicon Valley is dead. Past tense, forget it. it hasn't happened yet. It keeps coming back in some new way. And what I see is actually, because I try to monitor this, a con an accelerating inflow of entrepreneurs coming here from other parts of the world, of overseas governments and private organizations opening more and more incubators and accelerators here, and more and more overseas headquartered corporations opening innovation offices here. So I, I think the tide is actually coming in. I think the question for the future is that maybe two things. One, we're so expensive. So do we get to a point where we just price ourselves out of the market because we're just so expensive to hire engineers? Uh, but the other is that we, we really are like the center of a global innovation network with various hubs, all of which are places with unique advantages of their own, but usually very distinctive, strong pools of, of talent, of human capital. And they interconnect, and that human capital goes back and forth, and the investment goes back and forth. So. I think we're looking, we'll be looking over time, but not Silicon Valley diminishing, uh, but, and, but, and remaining at this, the center of this global complex, but, but being the center of a larger, more diversified networks of countries and cities around the world that uh, have similarities, similar needs, similar resources, but that are complementary in, in various ways and will continue to exchange people and investment. All right. I'm getting the timeout signal, um, so let me just make one final comment. Human capital relies on great universities, so hopefully um, Berkeley can contribute to the human capital formation in Silicon Valley. But please join me in thanking the panel. Uh, this has been really fun.